Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the University of Delaware's National Agenda Program. I'm Ralph Begleiter, the director of the Center for Political Communication. This is our final program for the year. I hope you've enjoyed meeting our speakers from the Colbert Report, from the world of digital campaigning, from the news media, and from the world of campaign strategy. Our guest speakers tonight, Stephanie Cutter and Steve Schmidt, have spent decades, literally, of their lives working in the world of polit politics and political communication, running political campaigns, winning them and losing them. Regardless of their win-loss records, these experts find themselves in demand all around the world and in all walks of politics. Tonight I'm going to introduce Stephanie first and then come back to Steve. But before we begin, just a reminder that we're actually encouraging everyone to use your mobile devices tonight to comment on what you hear. So tweet away, don't turn off those phones, just be sure to silence them, please. And don't forget our political film series called Fade to Black, about the dark humor of political feature films right here in Mitchell Hall. Our last film of the season, two weeks from tonight on Wednesday, December 3rd, is Thank You for Smoking the 2006 feature about the tobacco industry's political spin on cigarettes and health. Thank you. I was wondering about that. Stephanie Cutter was deputy campaign manager in 2012 for President Obama's re-election campaign. Then she chaired his inauguration committee. Between 2008 and 2012, Stephanie was a White House advisor to President Obama, who, among other things, designed the confirmation strategy for Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. In the early 2000s, Stephanie was an advisor to Senators Edward Kennedy and Harry Reid, and she worked as communications director for the John Kerry presidential campaign against George W. Bush in 2004. You have seen Stephanie as a co-host of CNN's Crossfire program. The New York Times has called her polished but sometimes scary. <laughs> and Politico anointed her as one of the most prominent voices in the Democratic Party. Stephanie is a graduate of Smith College and Georgetown University Law. Please welcome Stephanie Cutter to the University of Delaware. I don't think that New York Times quote was exactly right, <laughs> Thank you um, all for having me here today. It's been uh, an incredible day. We've had time to um, attend a class, um, spend time with students at dinner, um, and this is my first time at the University of Delaware, and I just want to say the entire experience so far has been incredible, and I'm cr incredibly impressed by the students um, and the education uh, you're getting here. Um, thank you, Ralph, for having us, and it's also a pleasure to be on stage with my friend Steve Schmidt. Uh, we have been um, uh, on opposing sides of many campaigns, um, and uh, if there's one person I don't want to be on the opposing side of, it's Steve Schmidt, but he is a formidable uh, opponent, but also a very good friend. Um, so I was asked to talk about what happened in the most recent elections. and. I, uh, quite frankly, it's, it's easy to explain. Democrats got their butts kicked. And uh, there's, uh, there's lots of reasons, um, atmospheric reasons, um, historical reasons, uh, why, why that's the case. And I'll go through them fairly quickly. Um, and there are some things that Democrats need to learn coming out of uh, this election. But just to set it up, um, historically, uh, sitting presidents in their sixth year of their presidency lose seats in midterm elections. That's number one. Um, on average, seven Senate seats. Uh, there's been very few times um, in history where that's not been the case. Uh, most recently, President Clinton uh, gained seats in his sixth year uh, most because of impeachment and the Republican overreach. That was a backlash against Republicans. But it's very uncommon. Um, Number two, in terms of atmospherics, the playing field in which Democrats were playing was incredibly red territory. Uh, we were playing away games everywhere. Um, and m something like, of the 23 seats that Democrats uh, uh, were fighting in, um, the president had lost in 2012 and two th 2008 in something like 11 of them. 
and in most cases by double digits, uh, even you know, into the 20s against John McCain or, or Mitt Romney. Um, so this was not favorable territory uh, to Democrats. Um, and then the third thing is President Obama. Uh, the best indicator uh, for uh, which way an election is gonna go in a midterm is the president's approval rating. And the president's approval rating was in the low 40s, still is. Uh, so it, it, we knew that he would be a drag on some of these candidates. Um, so in terms of a strategy of how Democrats were handling the election, um, you know, it was important to make it a choice uh, between two candidates, uh, whether the, the sitting Democratic senator and the Republican uh, opposing candidate, uh, and not a referendum on Obama. Different campaigns handled it in different ways. Those that most successfully did it made it about local issues. Um, uh, you know, Kay Hagan is a good example. Rather than one, running away from the president at every turn, she uh, focused on what was happening in her state, what she had been able to deliver for her state, uh, signs of independence, uh, but also pointing out where her opponent, Tom Tillis, who ultimately won that campaign, um, had gone awry of North Carolina. Um, he was the Speaker of the House. Uh, he was the author of some tremendous education cuts um, uh, that was a statewide discussion for most of that campaign. So for most of the, the campaign, up until uh, probably August, Democrats were competitive, if not ahead, in these top tier races um, because of the quality of our candidates, but also the campaigns that we were running. Uh, this was the first time that Democrats took um, some of the techniques that we had worked on from the presidential uh, campaigns in 2008 and 2012 and applied them to the states uh, in terms of turnout, data targeting, digital organizing uh, on a state level. And where we were involved, we were able to increase turnout amongst key demographics, the Obama coalition, per se, um, uh, in the election. But uh, it was not a good election day for Democrats in the House, in the Senate, uh, gubernatorial races, and in state legislatures across the country. Um, I think that most problematic is the state legislatures um, for a number of reasons. Uh, those are our future candidates, um, and they will play a big role in uh, election laws on a state level, uh, but also in redistricting um, that is, not, uh, is just around the corner. Um, and uh, so what, what do Democrats do from here? Well, we uh, can learn what, look at what worked and what didn't work. The DNC is running a process to look at that right now. Uh, we know that where we invested in the ground game uh, and didn't treat this as uh, midterm elections but used the apparatus that we had built through two presidential elections, we were able to make some progress. Um, the second thing that we should learn is that um, we need a stronger message. Uh, you know, lots of excuses could be made about why that message didn't get through. It could be Ebola, ISIS, um, you know, whatever crisis of the day there was. Uh, another excuse could be the president being sidelined, um, or it could be uh, the fault of the party and, and candidates themselves. It doesn't really matter. We just needed a message, and we didn't have one on the number one issue that voters cared about, which is the economy. We have a, a, a record to stand on, and we have a vision for where we want to take the economy, and none of that broke through. The third lesson I think that uh, we should take from this is that we can't run races, uh, a mirror race uh, of a previous election. This wasn't 2012. Um, this wasn't 2010. And uh, where we tried to do that, uh, we, uh, we lost. Uh, a good example of that is in Colorado. Um, I'm not sure how many people here followed that election closely, but it was uh, between Mark Udall, a sitting Democratic senator, against Cory Gardner, uh, who was a member of the House, Republic House of Representatives, a Republican, uh, challenging uh, the sitting senator. Um, in 2010, um, Michael Bennett, who's a, uh, the uh, senator from Colorado, won against his opponent, um, Ken Buck, by highlighting some of the things that Ken Buck had done and said um, that were offensive to women. 
um, whether it was you know, taking away their ability to make their own healthcare decisions, uh, you know, uh, being against contraception, um, and was able to paint a picture of somebody who wasn't in touch with uh, his female electorate. Um, you know, in 2012, Mark Udall tried to run that same race well, Cory Gardner wasn't Ken Buck. Uh, he didn't make the same mistakes. Uh, he was able to smooth out some of those edges and even run away from some of the positions he had taken on women's health. He backed away from a personhood amendment. Uh, he was all of a sudden in, in favor of over-the-counter contraception, things of that nature. So he was able to take those issues off the table. Uh, and we just we didn't adjust quickly enough. Um, so you can't run the race that uh, was run before you. You can learn important lessons, but you can't overlearn and try to mirror image what had happened two years, four years prior. Um, and then the, the last thing I would say is that um, Republicans learned some lessons uh, in going into uh, these midterms. Um, 2012, to me, feels like a decade ago. <laughs> it's not. It's just two years ago, which is shocking to me. Um, it, you know, the, the campaign that we ran for the president um, was, uh, uh, we played offense uh, pretty aggressively against Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney gave us a lot of uh, opportunities to do that. Uh, his comments on immigration, um, where um, uh, undocumented immigrants should self-deport, uh, hurt him tremendously in the Hispanic community. His comments on abortion, contraception, uh, women's health care generally hurt him tremendously in the, uh, it, for, with the women's vote. Um, his, uh, some of his foreign policies, uh, his, uh, his opposition to gay marriage, um, his inability to articulate a climate plan and not acknowledge the climate effects hurt him tremendously with the youth vote. Um, Republicans looked at that and understood that they were alienating the future American electorate, and they would never again be able to win a national election without understanding how to communicate to these demographics, um, and in some cases, adjust their positions. Uh, they worked with their candidates in the 2014 cycle uh, to, number one, pick better candidates that didn't make mistakes, um, but two, to work on their rhetoric uh, and their talking points so that they weren't walking into some of these problems um, that would alienate important demographics for their turnout. Um, and it worked. They got a lot better. Um, so Democrats need to get a lot better. And we need to uh, be uh, clearer about what the differences and distinctions are um, in our positions because they're still there. Um, but, you know, uh, 2016, while well, that's only two years from now, in presidential politics and congressional politics, it's a lifetime. Um, so what happens between now and then, no one can really predict. Um, but there's a lot of work I, being uh, uh, done by both parties to prepare us for whoever the nominee is, whatever the national challenges that we're facing. You just don't know what's going to be happening in the world. So it's an exciting time if you're looking ahead to 2016. We're obviously trying to pick up the pieces on the Democratic side and think about what we need to do to improve. Um, but it's wide open in terms of who the nominees are going to be on both sides um, for uh, the presidential. If Hillary Clinton chooses to run uh, for, on the Democratic side, she is more than likely to be the nominee. Um, on the Republican side, it's, you know, Steve can speak to this with a little bit more authority than I can, uh, but you have a number of governors. Um, I think uh, executive experience in the 2016 campaign will be very important. Um, uh, you have some young senators, Marco Rubio, um, and uh, a, a pretty wide bench of people uh, from all different parts of the Republican Party who are thinking about running. It'll be an interesting process. Uh, I think. Um, in some ways, the Republican Party will figure, about, figure out what they're about through that process. Um, and uh, if anybody is predicting today who the next president is going to be, uh, then uh, I would not put too much, too much money down on that, because anything can happen uh, between now and then. So with that, why don't I turn it back over to Ralph.
Thanks, Stephanie. Lot, lots of questions to ask, and we'll follow up a little bit later. We're especially proud to welcome Steve Schmidt back to his alma mater, the University of Delaware. Steve is vice chairman for public affairs of the world's largest public relations company, Edelman. He was a top advisor in President George W. Bush's successful 2004 presidential election campaign, then was a White House advisor to President Bush. Like Stephanie, Steve also played a role in the confirmations of Supreme Court nominees, Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Samuel Alito. Steve also led the landslide re-election of California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger in 2006, resurrecting the Schwarzenegger campaign from what was widely seen as disaster. For that, Steve was recognized as Campaign Manager of the Year by the American Association of Political Consultants. And he managed the unsuccessful presidential campaign of John McCain in 2008, where he was famously instrumental in reviving a nearly dead McCain primary nomination and later in the selection of Sarah Palin as, as McCain's running mate. Some of you may not know this, Steve is one of the reasons Bloomberg News called the University of Delaware the epicenter of politics. He's a University of Delaware political science graduate. Today, Steve advises CEOs worldwide, nonprofits, academic institutions, and sports franchises, as well as, of course, all kinds of politicians, not just in the United States, but around the world. Please welcome Steve Schmidt home to the University of Delaware. Uh, thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, it's great to uh, be back here at the University of Delaware. It's a place that I have a lot of great memories from, and it's been a great experience getting to come back to this university uh, really on an annual basis for the last six years, and uh, particularly happy today to be able to share the stage with Stephanie Cutter, a good friend of mine who I have known for many years and simply one of the best in the business. Um, no one tougher, smarter, better, and I can tell you, having been on the other side of her on many, many political fights, including a couple of presidential campaigns and uh, Supreme Court nominations, there's just no tougher adversary that you could be up against, but a, a great person and a good friend and just thrilled that she's able to come to see and uh, meet some of the students at this great university. Um, so we just had an election, 2014. Uh, it's over. The ending of that election, of course, signals the beginning of the next election, the presidential election in 2016. And the reality of the matter is, is that presidential elections begin even before the end of that last midterm election. But let's talk a little bit about this last midterm election and, and what's going on in American politics generally. So if you go back now to 2006, where the Democrats in the sixth year of the Bush presidency have an overwhelming victory, take control of the House and Senate majorities. Of course, the election of Barack Obama in 2008, a Republican wave election in 2010, a Democratic electoral landslide in 2012, and an overwhelming Republican victory in 2014. So what we're seeing right now is an unprecedented level of volatility in our political markets. This is very unusual to see these types of wild swings between the two parties in successive election cycles over the better part of a decade. And I think it bears um, mentioning because we should talk about what's driving that. I really think the defining issue of our time is the collapse of trust in very nearly every major institution in the country, the exception being the U.S. military. It's not just the political parties, and it's just not, just not the political leadership of the country. Uh, it's the financial institutions, it's big business, it's labor unions, it's media. You name the institution, you name the icon, and one need look no further than the dramatic fall of Bill Cosby over the last week. Institution after institution, esteemed figure after esteemed figure, has betrayed the public trust in the eyes of the American people. And the result of that is the lowest levels of trust 
in major institutions in the history of polling. And all of that takes place in the context of the American people, historically the most optimistic people on earth, in a prolonged season of pessimism, where they believe the country is headed in the wrong track, they believe the country is headed in the wrong direction, they don't have confidence in the institutions and the political leadership of the country to get it going in the right direction again. And so that environment is what sets the table for 2014. And think about what a remarkable summer this, is, this has been that leads up into the fall election. Some period of time after the last American troops have withdrawn from Iraq, American forces are once again engaged in Iraq as the Islamic State holds territory across Syria, across Baghdad, and now sits 35 miles outside of the green zone where the U.S. Embassy is housed and is expanding and taking more territory on a daily basis. Images of beheadings of Americans playing out on the evening news. The Ebola outbreak with Ebola coming to the United States. Miscommunication by the public health services in a number of instances driving a panic fueled in large part by a media looking for ratings. All of these events together creating a sense of anxiety in the country where the American people process this very much through the prism. If you look at the aggregate and the totality of all the polls, you know that very much they, they sense that the wheels, uh, so to speak, proverbially, may be coming off of the wagon. And the American people are very upset about it. They're upset about the leadership in the country. They're upset about the direction of the country. So what was this race about? Well, this race was fundamentally a referendum on the Obama presidency at its six-year mark. Every single Republican candidate running for federal office made their campaign about Barack Obama. Every single Democratic candidate running for office tried to distance themselves from Barack Obama, trying to position themselves as an independent voice. Most remarkably was the Democratic nominee in Kentucky against Mitch McConnell, Allison Lundergan Grimes, who wouldn't even acknowledge that she had voted for the president. Now, at the end of the day, this isn't so different than kayaking in the ocean faced with a big wave. The only way through that wave is through it, bow first. If you get sideways to it, you will get swamped and knocked over. So all of the Democratic candidates, I think, who tried to distance themselves from the president, it was a fruitless effort because, of course, he is the head of the Democratic Party. Uh, he's the president of the United States, and they've all supported him. And in the case of many of these candidates, they owe their seats in the first place to President Obama's meteoric rise and his success in 2008, um, where many of these freshman senators, for example, were elected. Um, but what the election was fundamentally about, in this case, was the American people's rendering a judgment on an unpopular president with approval levels in the low 40s, very similar where President Bush was in the 2006 election, and the results are what they are. Now, what's interesting about the results is the degree to which the Republican Party remains as unpopular um, at the point of the election in November as it was going back to 2012. And it's important for Republicans not to take away meanings and lessons from this election that aren't borne out by, by reality. Now, the Republican Party did not run on an agenda. The Republican Party did not run on a platform in this election. There were not policy ideas put forward. There was not an economic growth agenda put forward. What was put forward was steely, steady opposition to the president. We will stop his agenda. And so for Republicans, the challenge will now be having gotten the majority in the way the dog who chases the car gets the bumper is what do we do with it? And so it's important for Republicans, I think, now to step back in a way from some of the excesses that have really plagued the brand over the last couple of election cycles. And when you look at the 2014 election, I think it bears mentioning 
and is probably the most significant aspect of this election, is what did not happen. And what did not happen in this election is what happened in the 2012 election, in the 2010 election, where with a spectacular constellation of truly nutty candidates across the country, the Republican Party gave up six United States Senate seats between 2010 and 2012, including one of those Senate seats being in this state where Christine O'Donnell wins the Republican primary with a 12% Republican turnout. Mike Castle is defeated, someone who surely would have gone on to be elected to the United States Senate. You saw it happen in Nevada with Harry Reid. You saw it happen in Missouri with Todd Akin, he of the famous or infamous legitimate rape comment. None of that happened in this election cycle. And that is a important development for the Republican Party that I think finally got serious about containing some of the nuttiness that has come out of the most extreme parts of the party over the last, over the last couple of years. And this is important as we look ahead to 2016. It is the case, without exception, that every demographic group in this country that is growing, Democratic Party is gaining market share. And that's true today despite the temporary disillusionment of millennial generation, for example, with the president, every single demographic group in the country that's growing, Democratic Party's gaining market share. Every single demographic group in this country that is shrinking, the Republican Party continues to gain market share. If you're in the marketing business for a living, this is a fundamentally huge structural problem. The average talk radio listener in this country is white, male, rural, and over 68 years old. On a range of issues, the party is out of step with some of the fastest growing demographics in the country, including on a range of social issues with the largest generation in the history of the country, the millennial generation. And I'll come back to that in a second. When you look at the Hispanic vote, Republicans got 38% of the Hispanic vote in this midterm election. Mitt Romney got 27%. In order for a Republican candidate to win the presidency, Republican candidate needs to be right around 40% of the Hispanic vote, which George W. Bush got 43% of in 2004. And so the opening act of the 2016 campaign is going to occur later this week with President Obama's executive order which essentially legalizes several million people that are in the country illegally. And that will be the foundation and the backdrop against which this battle for the Hispanic vote begins to play out for 2016. And we can talk a little bit more about that in the questions. But going further into 2016, if you look at just the states that the Democrats have won, six out of the last six elections, which does not count Florida, does not count North Carolina and Virginia and New Hampshire and Iowa and New Mexico and Colorado and Ohio. They have 242 electoral votes with 270 needed to win. So structurally, it's very difficult to win an election when the other side starts out with a lock of 242 electoral votes. And the challenge for any of the Republican candidates is to be able to offer a plausible path about how to unlock that map to put states that have not been in play in play in 2016 in a campaign where the likely Democratic nominee at this point in my view is going to be Hillary Clinton. And who is best positioned to do that? So in the Republican Party, I think that there are two classes of candidates that you will see. There are candidates that are members of Congress, and there are candidates that are governors of states. The next presidential election is always a reaction, at some level, to the last president. There's two types of elections. There's change elections, and there's more of the same elections. More of the same elections. 1984, when Ronald Reagan wins 49 states, is an example of a more of the same election. The election that Stephanie and I were opposing, um, on opposing sides on in 2004 was very much a jump ball election between those two, where 
We were arguing all throughout the course of that campaign on an access, was it a change election or more of the same? And then there are clear change elections, and 2008 would be an example of that, where the country was ready for a change after eight years of an unpopular presidency, and I believe in 2016 we're going to be heading into a change election. And what that means for Republicans is that, in my view, the chances that the Republican Party will nominate a first-term United States senator with no executive experience in their 40s is 0.0. Not going to happen. I think for sure we will nominate one of the governors who will run, and it will be somebody with substantial uh, executive experience. And then there's always the exception to the rule, and the exception to the rule in this election, who I think is the most interesting person in either party in terms of a presidential candidacy, is Rand Paul. And so Rand Paul, in my view, will not be the nominee of the Republican Party, but he could well come in second place in the Republican Party contest. He will certainly, in my view, win some caucus states. He could win a couple of primary states. But what's interesting about Rand Paul, if we look at from a national security perspective and we put things into their traditional ideological categories, a prospective Rand Paul candidacy against Hillary Clinton, Rand Paul is objectively in every measurement to the left of Hillary Clinton on any one of a number of national security issues. And you will see an enormous effort inside of the Republican Party and the institutions uh, that support the Republican Party to discredit Rand Paul as he gets ready to mount this, as he gets ready to mount this campaign. And specifically, you will hear a lot of talk amongst Republicans saying that if Rand Paul were the nominee of the party, that such and such Republican would actually support Hillary Clinton in a general election. And in fact, John McCain has alluded to that in a, in a series of contests. But Rand Paul is going to drive the debate in the Republican Party to some interesting places. Um, the first of them is on issues of privacy and government overreach with regard to the NSA, with regard to any one of a number of other government institutions that are typically not viewed as conservative or Republican issues. Rand Paul just spoke out at a event at Berkeley where he received a huge ovation from the multicultural audience of students. Uh, Rand Paul is the only presidential candidate to show up in Ferguson, Missouri so far to meet with community leaders. He has spoken out very extensively on issues such as mass incarceration reform, um, drug law, uh, legalization, and you will see other Republican candidates, I think, following his lead on some of these issues which you don't typically identify with Republican candidates, particularly the mass incarceration reform issues which allow Republicans to communicate into the African American community. One of the things that is interesting, and I think a challenge for Democrats as we look ahead to 2016, is how do you maintain the Obama coalition? So the Republican Party, founded in 1854, and by 1858, the majority party in all of the northern states, is by birth the northern party and the western party. It was a party created um, to fight slavery, uh, to keep the Union together, that has become, between 1968 and 1988, the Southern Party in the country. But the Republican Party was the natural home for African Americans until the 1932 election where FDR becomes president. And so we go all the way forward to the 2004 campaign where the black vote share that Republicans get drops to about 10%. But Republicans pretty typically got 10 to 11% of the black vote until Barack Obama runs for president, where Obama gets 99.5% of the black vote. And that is enough difference to put the president over the top in states like Virginia, in states like North Carolina. One of the questions in 2016, if you believe this will be a change election, 
And the Democratic candidate will have to try to do what we tried to do in 2008 with John McCain, which was to distance yourself from the unpopular incumbent president. How do you do that as a Democrat without alienating the core constituency and most loyal constituency of the Democratic Party? And if that black vote share drops from 99.5% back down to 90%, and Republicans can get that Hispanic vote share up to something closer to 40%, then the Obama coalition fundamentally falls apart, and Republicans have a chance at winning the presidency despite all of the demographic and structural issues that I just, that I just talked about. One of the things that Stephanie alluded to, and I agree with completely, is that between today and the next presidential election, events will shape the climate in which that election takes place. And I think the trajectory of where things are in the short term is not great in the sense that I don't believe we're going to be entering a season of calm, a season of peace, a season where the American people view that the seas have calmed, that prosperity is upon us. I think that we're in for a couple of years of more turmoil. And you also look at this through the context, whether it's the IRS, whether it's the Veterans Administration, uh, whether it's the CDC and the Department of Health and Human Services. One of the hallmarks of success for any Democratic president who is arguing for a greater and more active role for government in solving society's problems is the degree to which the American people believe that government is a solution and that they trust government to be the solution. And we're living in a time right now where trust has just completely collapsed with regard to the American people's expectations about government's capacity to go and provide the services that they're supposed to provide. And so that is an interesting backdrop for the 2016 election where Republicans have the opportunity to go and not be the anti-government party, uh, which is not a winner with the American people, but to be the reform and renewal party, to go and make an argument that the sclerotic institutions of government that aren't doing what they're supposed to do, that don't deliver services with anywhere near the efficiency of the private sector, need to be reformed, need to be downsized, need to be brought under control and heal so that they can provide the services that the American people expect them, expect them to do. Um, I talked for uh, a minute about the Hispanic vote share, and I'll just leave um, mentioning this. I'm a longtime advocate uh, for immigration reform inside the Republican Party. And I am a longtime advocate that the Republican Party should be a big tent party, that it should take its message to every barrio in this country, to the inner cities of this country, that we should reach out to African Americans, we should reach out to younger voters, we should reach out to Hispanics. And I think that conservatism uh, as a political philosophy is grounded uh, in both pragmatism and reality. And the reality is, is that this country's never going to deport 12 million people from its shores. We've had a de facto amnesty in the country for 30 years. We have 11 million people living here in reality um, dictates that we should do something about their status um, because it is A, the right thing to do, B, it is good for the economy, and C, this is a huge and broken part of our federal government's responsibility, which is, to, which is to secure the border. And I think that Republicans should pass immigration reform. One of the most pernicious uh, things that exist in Washington today is what's called the Hastert Rule, which means that the, in the House of Representatives, no vote gets taken up unless a majority of the majority supports it. And this was fundamentally what George Washington was warning about in his farewell address to the nation when he talked about the danger of faction. Because we don't live in a parliamentary system, and the way that our system works is that in a Congress with a House of Representatives, 
that Republicans and Democrats should be encouraged to work together across regional lines, across state lines, to put together majority coalitions. And if there was a vote on immigration reform tomorrow in the House of Representatives um, where it was brought to the floor, it would pass uh, with a minority of Republicans, but a substantial number, and a majority of Democrats. And so what the President is going to do on Friday um, is with executive order by executive fiat, he's going to legalize and fundamentally rewrite the country's immigration laws with a stroke of a pen. And myself, along with every Republican in the country, and not a small number of Democrats, and not a small number of editorial writers, view this executive action as unprecedented, as unconstitutional, and frankly dangerous. Uh, to our constitutional order. And what it will do is it will set off two years of political warfare in Washington that are at the next level of intransigence and obstinance and gridlock from anything we have previously seen. And at the moment that that executive order is signed, we will move into a period of crisis and very high stakes political gamesmanship. You know, for Republicans, um, to go out and to talk about this in a way that offends Hispanics could permanently put Hispanics into the Democratic Party camp in the way that has occurred in California. And the result in California is if you go back to 1994 where there was an anti-illegal immigration ballot measure called Proposition 187, which sought to deny all types of services from education, health care to anyone in the country illegally. So if you're in the country illegally, uh, you can't send your kid to school, um, and if you break your leg, you can't access the emergency room. It passed by California voters. It was later deemed unconstitutional. But like a low-interest mortgage with a giant balloon payment, sometime off in the distance, it destroyed the Republican Party in the state. And sometime in late 2016, early 2017, the Republican Party in the state of California, Ronald Reagan's home state, Richard Nixon's home state, will become smaller than the decline to state or independent registrants and will become effectively the third party. And for the first time since we've had the two parties in American life since 1854, one of those two parties will slip into a third party status in an American state. And the reason for that is because of the antagonism of Latinos in the state of California towards the Republican Party and their total unwillingness to give it a second look. We come up on a moment, in my view, this week where Republicans could consign themselves to minority party status and a regional party status by reacting the wrong way to this executive order. Um, it would also be a tremendous mistake for Republicans to repeat the mistakes of the last year or so by shutting down the government. What Republicans, I think, would be wise to do is to have a um, more focused strategy of defunding the parts of government that are responsible for implementing the president's executive order. But regardless of what happens, you're about to see a very high stakes political uh, showdown begin. And this showdown will shape in fundamental ways uh, the 2016 campaign and contests, and watch closely how all of the Republican candidates seek to walk the line by being against the executive order, being tough on its unconstitutionality, but also not trying to antagonize Latino voters. So the first dramatic act of the 2016 campaign is upon us. Um, just a few weeks after the midterm election and still more than a month before we get out of 2014. Um, the New Hampshire primary, of course, is in February of 2016, about 15 short months away. We will have a late starting um, campaign, in my view. We'll see all of the campaigns announced by May, um, you know, even though they will officially be working. And I think just to go through it very quickly, on the Republican side, from a governor perspective, Governor Christie, a Delaware alumni, will run. Uh, governor Walker of Wisconsin will likely run. Governor Kasich of Ohio. Governor Perry of Texas. Uh, potentially Governor Pence in Indiana. 
um, will all likely run. I think one of the big questions out there, of course, for Republicans is whether Jeb Bush, uh, the highly accomplished governor of Florida, will be a candidate for the presidency. And then, of course, out of the Senate bracket, we'll see Ted Cruz, we'll see Rand Paul, we'll likely see Mar Marco Rubio, and we could see a couple of other people as well. Um, there will be, I think, in the spirit of 2012, from an outsider perspective, you will see a conservative celebrity, uh, a very talented neurosurgeon named Dr. Ben Carson run. Uh, he is highly articulate, um, a tremendous um, uh, speaker uh, who will perform well in the debates, uh, who is from outside of the system, an African-American. I think he'll get some attention. And Carly Fiorina, um, the failed Senate candidate from California, a former CEO of Hewlett Packard, is making trips to New Hampshire and she may um, run seeking to be you know, the Republican woman on the, on, the, on the ticket or on the ballot in these early states in a year where Hillary Clinton is, is likely to be the nominee. So I think when we look ahead to 2016, it is a wide open race on the, on the Republican side. And one word about Hillary Clinton is that while I do think she will be the nominee, uh, and I think one thing that Stephanie and I would agree on, is no one is given the nomination of their party as a gift. Um, no one is acclimated to it. There is only one way to the nomination, and it is the long, hard, and painful route up the mountain. And for sure, Hillary Clinton will have a primary challenger. I don't know who it will be, but it will be an ideological challenge from her progressive left, and progressives in this country will want a place uh, to go and to uh, send a message. Um, and there is a fault line in the Democratic Party between Clinton era economics and the progressive movement of today. And I think we'll see that debated um, probably more extensively and more dramatically in the Democratic primary process than most of the media is covering it today. Again, it's uh, tremendous to be back here at the University of Delaware and uh, happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Stephanie, if you want a word of rebuttal or comment on the uh, issue of uh, the immigration executive order, do you want to comment on Steve's analysis on that? Sure. Um, well, <laughs> trying to figure out where to start. Um, it, it, this, this could come as early as tomorrow. Uh, and what, uh, you know, I don't have any inside information about what he's uh, going to do. I'm reading things in the, in the news just like you are. But what I think he's going to do is to um, uh, begin a legalization process for parents of uh, American uh, 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 um, uh, immigrants, uh, children that were born here or are legal citizens. And uh, the bill that passed the Senate more than a year ago uh, also allowed for that. That bill was more expansive um, in terms of legalization. This would be a, a more narrow track. Um, Steve mentioned that uh, it's unconstitutional and it will set off a political firestorm. I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, Ronald Reagan did the same thing. So did George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, I worked in the Clinton administration um, and the Clinton White House, um, uh, particularly uh, in the tail end of the presidency, impeachment on, um, and executive actions were the only way we got anything done because there wasn't uh, a Congress that was willing to work with us. Um, and it's long been a tool of sitting presidents to use their administrative authority um, to get things done, uh, particularly when there isn't a legislative alternative. That's number one. Number two is Republicans are up in arms that the president's doing something that they should be doing, <laughs> um, that they think is their authority to act on. Well, go ahead and act. Do something. They've been talking about immigration reform. Uh, you know, the, the Senate bill was passed more than a year ago. John Boehner refused to even bring that bill up for a vote because, of, as Steve said, of the Hassert rule, that he couldn't get a majority of his caucus to oppose it 
uh, and if he took away the Hassett rule and let the House vote naturally and let the chips fall where they may, that bill would have passed and he would, ha would have had a significant problem with the right wing of his party. And they, his candidates would have been primaried all over the country. Those politics haven't changed. Republicans are not gonna pass comprehensive immigration reform. They're not gonna take up the Senate bill or put these parents of uh, legal Americans uh, on a track for family unification. They're not gonna do that. So this, this entire you know, so-called political firestorm that the uh, president is so-called uh, you know, supposedly creating with this administrative action is a complete farce. But let me tell you the difference between how the president governs and how this new Republican leadership, which only got more conservative in this election, it's not like they've found uh, their moderate wing after 2014. The likelihood of passing immigration reform is not greater as a result of this election. It's, it's significantly weaker. But let me tell you the difference between how the president and this new Republican majority choose to govern. The first thing Mitch McConnell lists out, uh, John Boehner lists out after they win the majority of what they're gonna do with their agenda. Repeal of the president's signature accomplishment, the health care reform law, repeal. Why isn't that a political firestorm? The first, their first act that they're going to do is to try to repeal something that the president uh, put his, staked his political legacy on and has been uh, working feverishly to implement with millions of people now getting health care because of it. They're going to try to repeal it. Why isn't that a frontal assault in our, uh, in our ability to work together? Instead of the president saying, forget it, that I'm not gonna work with you on anything else and I, I'm gonna shut down the government, he says, well, you know what, we're gonna disagree there and I'm not gonna allow you to do that, but I also wanna find other areas uh, to work on with you. I wanna find areas where we can come to agree. Republicans are threatening that if the president does immigration reform through executive action, then that's it. No chance for agreement on anything else. Threats of shutting down the government, using budget authority to cut off funding for critical initiatives. That, you know, we're breaking whatever sort of agreement there was as, uh, after the 2014 uh, election. There was no agreement. So the Republicans can choose to do two things. And, and Steve's analysis on this piece is right. That this is a, a real conundrum for the Republican Party because they are gonna have a hard time controlling their right wing, uh, many of whom are sitting right in the House of Representatives in the United States Senate, um, in opposing the president's action. And they can say it's because they don't think it's constitutional, but I guarantee you that's not what Americans are gonna hear. And particularly Hispanic Americans, they're not gonna hear that. They're just gonna hear that Republicans are against unifying these families, reuniting these families. Or Republicans could understand where the country is on this issue and look at what actions they can take. If they disagree with what the president did, then they should move on something to begin the process of comprehensive immigration reform. They should try to pass something that is, is reform and not just a mirage of reform in order to send more money down to border security. We, we'll see how they act, but those are the two choices that they have. And I think, you know, I think they need more people like Steve giving them advice about how to handle this issue because it, this could uh, make them the minority presidential party for at least two or three elections to come. All right, I want to get to your questions, but I've got to ask one more of um, uh, Stephanie, if I may, because Steve talked about prospective <laughs> candidates on the, Demo on the Republican side. What if Hillary doesn't run? There's been a lot of discussion about whether she'll run or whether she won't run, and mm -hmm. you don't need to necessarily go into the rationale for that, but who are the other potential candidates? Well, I think that she will run, but uh, others that are, are potential candidates, uh, you know, one of your most famous alum, <laughs> Vice President Biden, uh, is rumored to be thinking about it. I think he'd be a great president. Um, uh, there's rumors that Elizabeth Warren is thinking about it. She says that she's not running, but uh, 
Um, I think that uh, as my, more time goes on and her support increases and uh, you know, she's got a new leadership role in the Democratic Senate, um, uh, that there's a possibility that she might get in if, if Hillary doesn't run. If Hillary runs, I don't think that she'll get in. Um, uh, Martin O'Malley uh, is putting the groundwork together to, to run. I think he's running regardless of whether Hillary Clinton runs. Bernie Sanders, um, senator, independent senator from Vermont, um, is very strongly rumored to be putting together a presidential campaign. I don't think he is a viable candidate for the nomination, but I do think he will influence the debate. Uh, and then there's people like you know John Hickenlooper, who is the governor of uh, Colorado, uh, just came through a very tough uh, re-election campaign, uh, but has taken very strong stances on things like climate and gun control, um, but also has that Dem Western Democratic edge to him, uh, where he um, uh, you know, has progressive positions, particularly on social issues, uh, but is seen as a moderate Democrat. Um, so those are the people that are starting to make noises about this. I'm sure that there are others that, if Hillary doesn't run, will suddenly pop their heads up and say, I'm in too. Uh, but most people believe that she is going to run, and if she does, uh, it's, uh, you know, overwhelmingly likely that she's going to be the nominee, uh, and she'll take up a lot of oxygen uh, in the process over the course of uh, the Democratic primary. Okay. And I, think there's, I think there's one more. I think that Jerry Brown might run. <laughs> it would be very interesting. Okay. That certainly speaks to the future, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> He's a young 80. <laughs> All right, your questions. Now, we, we only have a limited amount of time tonight. I'm sure you have questions. We're going to alternate, as usual, between students and non-students. We're going to go for a student question first. Let me see your hand way up high if you have a question. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask about the Obama legacy. So um, when Harry Truman ended his presidency, he was very unpopular. Uh, but over time, his reputation changed very dramatically. Warren Harding, on the other hand, left the presidency very, very um, Thought it was a very high, thought of very highly. Later on, it was clear that his presidency was not as clear, not as good as, as people thought at the time. So, as Obama's uh, presidency is wrapping up, uh, I wonder if you both have takes on where, what Obama will be thought of 10 years, 20 years down the road. Okay, question is 10 years or 20 years down the road, how will President Obama's presidency be viewed? I think it's very difficult to say, and I would also say that there are events unfolding in uh, the Middle East right now, and events unfolding in the Russian near abroad right now, um, and in the South China and East China Sea from a national security perspective that are all unwritten. And I think like most second term presidents um, with opposition party controlling uh, the, um, you know, controlling, controlling the Congress, you know, the president will look to build a legacy in foreign affairs and national security issues like all of his predecessors have, all of his predecessors have done. I mean, we're living in a period of time where, you know, the borders written by the British and French after the First World War are collapsing across the Middle East. The um, world is changing very, very rapidly and uh, how the president handles that and deals with that and decisions he makes um, of events yet to occur, I think will shape his legacy in a really powerful way. The one thing I would say- More powerfully than the legacy of the healthcare law, for sure. example. Sure, look, I, I think, um, you know, my, well, look, I think, um, you know, since, you know, look, in the last 10 days, you know, to be grubered is a new verb in the English language. And I think when you look at Gruber's comments on the health care law in the Supreme Court case, I think if the subsidies collapse um, or are found unconstitutional, right, you know, Obamacare fundamentally collapses. And Republicans are going to have to have a plan about what to do with that um, because people will be very unhappy um, with regard to the anxiety and settlement around all of the health care issues. But, but I will say this, one aspect of his legacy for sure. Um, Democrats in unison have been very effective 
at blaming the Republicans for the president's inability to get legislation passed. And a lot of that criticism is on point. Republicans have not cooperated with this president in anywhere near the level that they should have. However, 20 years from now, if there's not a domestic policy you know, body of work, nobody's gonna look back and say, Mitch McConnell was a really mean guy, or John Boehner you know, was you know, obstinate in working with the president. They'll remember the president, not the Congress. And so that sharing of blame is going to dissipate over time, and it will rest entirely on the president. Stephanie, on the legacy 10 to 20 years out. Uh, I think that the president's uh, domestic legacy um, is, uh, you know, and I don't think it's 10 to 20 years out. I think it, he's going to end uh, his term, his second term strong. Um, even with a Republican Congress, the president has a pretty robust agenda that he's going to try to get done. You know, I remember sitting in the Roosevelt Room with him at one of our early campaign meetings um, uh, in late 2011, where he listed out all of the things he still wanted to do. Um, and this was a, a private meeting. This wasn't to set the agenda for the campaign. This was a, a discussion amongst President and his aides. And it was climate change. It was implementing the health care law. It was moving us forward on civil rights and social issues. Uh, it was addressing education reform, and it was rebuilding an economy uh, that had been crushed, um, not just as a result of the 2008 crisis, but of, of years of policies um, that took away some of the, the fundamental structures that protected the middle class. And if you look at what he's done in the two years since he's been reelected, the most substantial step forward to reduce carbon pollution the most substantial step forward in reducing climate change. Um, huge step forwards on gay marriage, um, equality for women, um, investments in manufacturing, um, uh, reforms to education, working with governors, since we couldn't get congressional action, uh, working with governors, uh, using his administrative authority to give flexibility under the law for them to uh, put critical reforms in place um, and uh, be more effective and efficient with federal dollars. You know, these are things that uh, aren't, uh, don't have immediate effect, um, but they are big substantial structural things in our economy, um, uh, in uh, our, our climate, in our social structure that um, I don't think will take long for people to look back and say, this guy got a lot of things done even in the face of a Republican Congress uh, who, you know, their only goal over the last six years, first it was to make Obama a one-term president, which they were unsuccessful at, uh, and then it was uh, to position themselves to make uh, Obama, a, a referendum on Obama for the 2014 campaign. Let's take a question from a non-student. Raise your hand high, please. Okay, over here. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, Stephanie, I didn't mention in your bio, you, you were obviously an advisor to uh, Michelle Obama, and the question is about the Let's Move campaign. Uh, how did that come about? What was the goal? How successful will it be? Is it? So uh, the, this is something that the First Lady was interested in uh, uh, even before the President decided to run for President. Um, it was something that she had been working on with her own children. Um, you know, she tells a, a story that may be familiar to you. She took one of her daughters to the pediatrician, and the pediatrician um, said that her daughter uh, had weight problems, that there, she was obese by current weight standards. And, uh, you know, the first lady was uh, working, um, trying to raise two children. Her husband was in the state senate hundreds of miles away. Um, so there was a lot of fast food. There was a lot of... Um, uh, um, 
uh, quick meals that were put together, not necessarily balanced. So she started to pay attention to it with her own daughters. As she hit the campaign trail, she noticed that this was a, a common topic uh, amongst parents, particularly mothers, and how you can work full time, raise children, put a balanced meal on the table, uh, and ensure your kids are getting a healthy start. Um, that grew over time uh, on the campaign trail um, to be a, a, a core of her stump speech about how we can give parents the tools to make better decisions um, uh, for nutrition for their kids. Um, when the president was elected, uh, um, uh, Michelle became the first lady. She was thinking about her agenda. Um, the first thing she did was to create a White House garden um, so that she could show people how to put balanced meals on the table. Um, but she was very interested in creating a national movement, um, not to dictate anything, but to pr just provide tools for parents to make it easier for them, the information that they need. Um, uh, or the information they were looking for of how to make all of this work. Um, I got a call and I had uh, taken a leave of absence from the White House um, when Senator Kennedy was ill and had moved up to Boston and was, was teaching at Harvard. I got a call that fall um, from the First Lady's office saying, can you, can you come help us with this? Um, and I did it as a volunteer from the outside. I was still up at Harvard. Um, and it, it started to grow into the development of a campaign um, to raise attention to childhood obesity, but also mobilize uh, different sectors of society to addressing it. Um, it wasn't just about the federal government. It wasn't about telling parents what to do. It was providing information um, and exposing the issue so that parents could make their own best decisions. You know, how, how did we come up with the name Let's Move? Um, uh, there were core components of the campaign. It was physical activity, it was food deserts, it was uh, information. Um, and I'm really taking this out of the recesses of my memory now. <laughs> um, and, you know, we wanted something that denoted all of these uh, different aspects of the campaign. Um, and Let's Move really just came out of uh, discussions um, of what we wanted this campaign to be about. We wanted it to be active. Um, action-oriented, um, and uh, you know that's basically how we develop Let's Move. Obviously, it's been incredibly successful. Um, for the first time in years, the rate of childhood obesity, obesity has started to decrease. Uh, the goal of Let's Move is to solve childhood obesity in the next generation, um, and we're certainly on the, on the way to doing that. We're obviously not there. There's a lot of work to do, but if you look at who's been mobilized as a result of it, um, governors, uh, the sports industry, um, uh, the media establishment, um, uh, doctors, um, teachers, school systems, parents, uh, the, you know, the amount of people who have become engaged in this campaign has been really both overwhelming and inspirational. So I give, I give lots of credit to the First Lady for doing this. Question from a student. Student over in here, yes. What I okay. say, what I, say um, I, I gotta just paraphrase because we're, we're recording. So the question basically is, uh, is that uh, Rand Paul's candidacy, uh, is, that, is it gonna be a problem for Rand Paul's candidacy that, that Steve mentioned that it's mostly gonna, likely to be a, a governor that's gonna succeed rather than a, a senator? It, it's very difficult for the incumbent presidential party after a second term to win a third term. The last time it happened is with George Herbert Walker Bush in 1988, and Ronald Reagan had a 59% approval rating. So when I say it's gonna be a change election, it's gonna be a change election, I believe, in that the country's going to wanna to go in a new direction. And that I don't see that there's a path distinct from the legacy question, right? You know, and how all this sorts out in 10 to 20 years, you know, is anybody's guess. 
But I think when you look at the issues the country is facing, you look at the political dynamic in Washington, I think it is improbable to impossible for the president to see his political numbers rise up, you know, north of 50. And I think he's going to be in the 40s and potentially in the 30s, much the same way that George W. Bush was for the balance of his second term. So the dynamic of the conversation is going to be one about change. And of course, you know, the president famously ran on and won on a change message in 2008. Hillary Clinton, by virtue of being the first woman who, let's say, is the nominee of one of the two major parties and first prospective uh, president, um, who's a woman, embodies and represents change um, in a fundamental way. So just because it's a change election doesn't mean that that disqualifies the Democratic, the Democratic candidate, though it, puts a, though it puts a burden on it. I think that Rand Paul inside the Republican Party is interesting, you know, for any one of a number of reasons, but I do think that Rand Paul's problem is that the world we are living in is likely to be more chaotic from today, not less chaotic, and I think that his national security and foreign policy views are broadly out of step with the majority of the Republican Party and a substantial percentage of the Democratic Party you know, what I would call the national security wing of the Democratic Party. And he for sure is to the left of, of Hillary Clinton on any one of a number of national security issues, which is why you will hear many Republicans say that if Rand Paul was the nominee of the Republican Party, they will endorse and vote for Hillary Clinton because they will trust Hillary Clinton to be an effective commander in chief, even though she wouldn't be their first choice. I'm afraid both of our speakers have other commitments they have to make, and so we're going to have to wrap it up right now. Before we say thanks to our guests, just a reminder that if you want to be aware of programs like this next year, put yourself on our email list. You can sign up on one of the bright orange sheets out in the lobby on your way out this evening, and you'll be sure to be informed about programs like this. Now please let's thank our speakers tonight, Stephanie Cutter and Steve Schmidt, for coming to the University of Delaware. Thank you both very, very much.